Welcome back, everyone. I'm here with Laird Barron. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, you know, a topic that I've talked about uh, to a limited extent in the past. But Laird is, as you all know, a science fiction horror crime writer. But he's also had an interesting or very interesting lived experience in the remote wilderness in Alaska, as well as Montana. He lives in New York, uh, Hudson Valley in New York now. And he's had a number of life experiences that I think are intriguing. Uh, this has started with, there was a Twitter thread he had back in October where he talked about some of these experiences. Uh, he also discussed some of them on Lovecraft easing. And, you know, now that he's on this show, Laird, I want to ask you about, you know, what are some of the experience, you know, lived experiences that you've had that are kind of uh, unexplained or strange or things that you couldn't quite characterize? That have influenced your work sure well okay thanks for the question you know and just to preface it um i think my my viewpoint or my perspective on the paranormal the uncanny the inexplicable has really uh evolved over the years i'm quite i've come quite a, a long way from where i used to be even into my early 20s and in some ways, I'm far more, um, in, uh, I don't know, I, like, in other words, I, I, I feel the bedrock of me is far more um, credulous about certain aspects of, of this topic. And yet, in other ways, I've become almost an ultra skeptic. Mm -hmm. And it's these, it's a, there's, a, there's a tension here. And the reason that there is, is because for me, generally speaking, and, and this is a speaking as a layman, uh, fairly well read, but a layman nonetheless. A lot of experiences, anecdotal experiences, but a layman nonetheless. Uh, and the tension is this. In many, many cases, if not almost every single case of alleged, you know, uncanny uh, activity, there are multiple rational explanations, not the least of which being I don't know who you, you don't believe a word of a fucking word a witness says witnesses are least reliable We're, you know just because you see something doesn't mean that you saw something so there's mm -hmm. that but there's also uh things that science has not been able to explain and has actually designated as huh that's very unusual and there is preponderance of evidence and there are in my in you know in in my case uh things that I can't explain and that even the rational explanation, and this is the kicker for me, is that often the rational explanation is less desirable uh, or more frightening than some kind of uh, uncanny uh, explanation. Uh, an example being uh, one time in, in uh, this apartment that we were staying in Seattle, my, my girlfriend and I, we came home and we had thought someone had been in the apartment before. And so I'd actually put string and gum and different things so that if the door had been opened or a window was opened, I would know. So nobody had come into the apartment. Uh, place looked fine. I'm doing something. And my girlfriend cries out and she was in the bathroom and I walked in there. I knew instantly before she, she couldn't even speak. She was just, you know, kind of aghast. And I saw the shower curtain had been reversed. So the, somebody had pulled it off the hooks and turned it. We'd been gone 15 minutes. We'd both been in the bathroom. It was very obvious it had been turned. It was like, there's still water from the shower trickling down it. So, uh, you know, from our showers that day. Mm -hmm. So look, you know, a believer is going to go, okay, so you're sure nobody got in there then poltergeist. Okay. That's kind of a creepy conclusion if it's true, but you know, what's even creepier is that somebody, our, our landlady was 80 years old, sweet could barely move like a couple of times we got locked out of the apartment she came up you know and did it it was it had to be her or she had a, a grandson who was adult who sometimes came around so either so so i'm left with okay did she get into the apartment and do this or did she give the key to somebody either explanation was pretty frightening it's, it's the same thing as when people disappear and they're like disappear in thin air you know uh there's the explanation that they were whisked into another dimension or a monster got them or there's the explanation that the body is like underfoot like we were talking about the chest earlier that you just stepped over this person they fell in a hole 
you know, and, and you and the dogs have been walking over them looking for them and you never found them and they were right there. That happened in a small town here a few years ago. This kid went missing back in the 70s. Mm -hmm. Broad daylight, walking down the street. He walks out of like the quick stop. The barber waves at him. It's one of those towns. And he doesn't make it to the bus stop like two blocks away. And they're like, where'd he go? And they spent 30 years looking for him. Well, guess what? They had all these theories. There was some Satanist in town in a van. And they must have gotten him. Or alien, you know, there'd been alien sighting, you know, UFO sightings around there. All these explanations, right? Well, they found him. They found him. He had he waited and nobody was looking. And instead of going to that bus stop or where the hell he was going, he snuck into a building and it was an abandoned building. It was a bank. And he tried to climb down the chimney or the vent that goes into the bank and he got, and wedged got in stuck there. in there. Yep. And that's where he sat for 30 something years because the building, the what the room. One room, there was two buildings really close together and he, he had climbed over one or climbed through a window or done something. I can't remember the specifics, but the top floor of those buildings were abandoned. And by the time, and then people eventually let them out and they became other things. Those bones were in there. You know, they were, they were bones by the time there was no smell, there was no nothing. So there was a skeleton there for 30 years. And uh, when they did some renovations, they bashed through the wall and they found him wedged in there. And that's where he'd been. Uh, I, I have a story... I have a story that's not quite that creepy, but, um, you know, it's something that uh, I think I told John about on the, uh, on a prior episode, but I'll be quick about it. So I have a friend or, or a classmate who was a, he, he was stealth, he was a stealth bomber pilot. And prior to the invasion of Iraq, they would practice bombing runs over Midwestern cities. And every time he did one of these practice runs, there were UFO sightings. Now, whether or not UFOs showed up or whatever, whatever UFOs are, showed up at the same time, I'm pretty sure they were reporting his aircraft as they were flying over the city. So, you know, there's sometimes or oftentimes there's a, a prosaic explanation for these things. Well, right. And sometimes there's not, um, or not at least not an evident one. And I've had... Right. I've had out of body experiences. I've had um, deja vu. I've had precognitive dreams, you know, and science will tell you that deja vu precognition are simply glitches in the brain, uh, you know, that you're not really anticipating something's going to be said. There's just a lag between you, you acknowledging something and, and or your, your perception and then your acknowledgement of it, that it's a brain lag. Right. And, but to me, that stuff's kind of, um, you know, is all is also pretty crazy. Like I said, the, the rational explanation can be can be can be the less desirable of them. Well, let, let, let's talk. Let's actually talk about the like out of body experience. You know, so the, the re, and the reason I'm interested in this, I just just read all of uh, Robert Monroe's. I think he, the first book he has is like Journeys Out of the Body and things like that, where <laughs> you know he set up a, an entire institute down in uh, rural Virginia which the uh, U.S. government actually contracted uh, with him to, to train several of its intelligence operatives to, um, to study there. And, and by the way, I'm not like I didn't read this on the like on the Internet. Like there's a there's a place on the CIA website where they have a documentation called uh, Crest. And uh, you can you can download declassified documents now as I'm going through this whole prelude, like there is a non-zero probability that a bunch of the documents up there are uh, an attempt at disinformation or maybe some other like MK ultra like experiment where they, you know, or they're trying to see how, you know, how these stories spread or who, who knows what, but, uh, uh, but, you know, Robert Monroe claimed to be able to, to do these out-of-body experiences um, and to be able to trigger them on his own. So in your experience, how, uh, you know, how have they manifest, like, how have you manifested it? Was it kind of, you just found yourself doing it, the experience or, and again, it could be all in your head, right. As you were kind of mentioning, like, what was that experience like for you? Well, I've had, I've had several, and I know that at least one of them was simply uh, objectively a hallucination, but it was, it was so real. I was, trapped in an ice storm or blizzard actually uh on topcock which is a sort of a, a mountain near um it's near white mountain which is a few about 80 miles um, uh, southeast of nome and 
I was on the editor rod and we got the dogs and I got pinned down. It was 80, 80 knot gusts. It was below zero. The effective wind chill factor was, you know, between 80 and hundred below. And I was trapped out there for 36 hours and froze my foot, froze my face, froze my hand. The dogs were fine. I mean, we were all roughed us up, but I was, I took most of it. It wasn't properly equipped and uh, nearly lost, nearly lost my foot. But one thing I do remember is um, I was in the sled bag and I woke up at one point because I couldn't actually get into the sleeping bag. So I just was wrapped up in it and I had a death grip in my mittens and I, and you couldn't, and you, you can't see more than three feet at the mm -hmm. most. I mean, you, if you put your arm, extend your arm in front of you, you can barely see your hand. And my, it, the wind was blowing. This wasn't the gust. The wind was blowing. The steady wind. Is this, is this night or day? Eight, oh, I was 36 hours, so it was everything. Um, but during the day, I woke up at one point, and it all became very surreal. I was dehydrated. I hadn't, I didn't, I mean, that drains you so quickly. Being, it's like being out in the desert and being wandering through the desert, you know, with the French Foreign Legion or something, one of those flicks where they do a face down in a dune. I, that's where I... You know, when the guy gets tired, he just does the face plant and surfs down the dune on his head. That's pretty much where I was. I mean, there's really not much functional difference. Frostbite and being burned are, the, are pretty much the same thing uh, physiologically or on a cellular level. But the point is, I woke up and my hands were cramped and I was kind of, I was, I was wrapped around the sleeping bag. I only had the end of it. The other end, the, the sled bag, I had my sled on its side down, you know, so I was like a buffer against the wind. My sled, my, my sleeping bag, and it was rated to like 40 below that it was not doing anything wouldn't have done anything for me it was as tight as um a sail on a ship it was literally flapping about a foot off the ground just like a kite just it was it was thrumming it was like it was like a g like a like a genie's uh carpet you could stand on it is what it looked like and i was just holding it so that's how that's how bad it was but there was a stretch there where i actually hallucinated that got the dogs the storm stopped i got the team ready and then i I mushed the team in, you know, the last five or six hours into the, into the finish line. And they were interviewing me about the storm. And it was all so realistic. It was, it was photorealistic. Orally, it was real, you know, audio, it was realistic. Like when I was walking, I could hear the snow crunching up into my ear. And then I woke up and I was still in the storm for another 12, 14 hours. But so, so, so that's like the objective end of it. I knew that I had dreamed almost instantly. And yet it was viscerally real. Uh, Another occasion, though, and I was th this one, I have no explanation for outside the fact that it's kind of frightening that your brain can do this and then not do it again ever. Uh, I was training my dogs. This was a few years after that. So this would be like 19. That was in 1991. So this would be like 1993, 94. And I took my dogs out on a run and I was up in the mountains and there weren't too many people around. Like it's, it's definitely like going up into the Catskills, you know, if, if there was a trail up into the Catskills and doing a big loop, but there was a section where they had carved a, like a seismic line and there was, there were uh, big power poles along it. And so I was mm -hmm. following that and keep in mind the rest of the run, it's about a three hour round trip. So it was about 40 miles, 50 miles round trip. Uh, I'm kind of at the end of the run. I'm getting ready to turn around and I hit the power line. I'm like, Oh good. I can turn this big team around. I had like 14 dogs. I can, it gives me a huge area. I'll go up ahead and I'll turn the team around the side of that hill way up there because there's no trees on it. It's just a big clear cut clearing. I don't know how to, like to this day, like, so this is like, you know, almost 30 years ago, the, the, the sense of dread just overcame me. Like I fell into deep water, like you're treading water and it's warm. And then you go, you go perpendicular in the water and it's cold beneath and it just shocks the shocks you how deep that cold and you realize how deep the water is and just how bitter cold it is mm -hmm. and the breath the breath just goes just went out of me and what what i experienced is i was no longer in my body for just i don't know how long two or three seconds so like an eternity but a couple heartbeats and what i saw is it's hard to describe this, but there's those movies. There's the movies that came out in the seventies and eighties where the heroine, it's usually, it was usually a heroine. She could see through the eyes of the killer. Like all of a sudden she would, she would kind of have a seizure and she'd go out of her body and mm -hmm. she'd be trapped and, and she, she couldn't do anything, but she'd be looking through the eyes of this guy as he's going after somebody and she'd be back in her body. And I think they've done that with malignant or something where, so, so the, so the hero, the POV character can see through the eyes of somebody else that's doing stuff. I had that experience. And it was absolutely, it was visceral. It was, I have no explanation. I mean, I'm sure it's a hallucination, but it didn't feel like it. 
And what happened is when I went out of my body, I was looking at myself from a distance about a quarter mile away, which is about how far I was from the, the hillside. And I had the impression or the hallucination that I was lying just out of sight on that hill at the top of the hill, like behind a, a snowbank and, peep, and peeping, you know, looking. And I was watching this guy, me and his dogs get closer and I was going to kill them. There was this, this sense of like, I, I had a rifle or I had, I don't know what I had. I never saw, I, I never looked down and saw anything, but I was laughing because I was like, oh, they're coming. You know, if they come up here over this hill, I'm going to get them. And it was this, uh, but it wasn't coherent. It wasn't like I could hear, like, like I was having a thought. It was more just the emotion of joy, evil glee. And then boom, I'm back in my body. And I almost fell off the back of the sled. It was that, it was that visceral and that jarring, that discombobulating. But the part that freaked me out and the reason I stopped the team right there and turned around and, and just, I just, a big mess, but I just did it right there is because right about then, all my dogs, I had, like I said, about 14 dogs. The leaders didn't do it, strangely. I think they were sniffing the trail, but some of the other dogs who were just sort of boredly behind them, you know, traveling, their ears pricked up and a couple of them, their hackles go up and then one of them started growling and they were looking up in that direction. They, they oh, smelled wow. something or saw something. Uh, even to this day, my heart just sped up a little bit. I got the goosebumps all over my body. And I, so I turned my team around and I got that feeling uh, you know, where somebody's sighting you with a rifle scope, which I've ha actually had happen. So I know that feeling. And it felt like someone was either glassing me or they had me in their, you know, in, in uh, telescopic lens. And we took off. And I was nervous enough that I, I, I usually travel with a lot of weight in training, drag a truck tire, you know, stuff to make the dog stronger. I cut all that off and just, we just hauled ass back. But for, we, we had to go about half a mile before we made a turn and we're out of sight of that hill. And the whole way, my dogs, some, not all of them, but some of them kept looking back, uh, like over their shoulders and were, you know, doing the accordion instead of being a nice taut line, the team right. kept looking back. So there was, they might've just been picking up on me, you know, my feeling, but it, I didn't stick around to find out. Wow. <laughs> that is extremely creepy. <laughs> Uh, uh, what, what other experiences have you had that are, I mean, and again, like you've, but you felt it was, you know, I'm not saying it was cause it could have been a hallucination, but to you, it felt like it was a human presence. Maybe probably, you know, the thing is, as I pre you know, preface this section with, right. There's a, I'm, I'm a, a hardcore skeptic when I was younger. I wasn't skeptic, uh, skeptical at all. You know, uh, if you presented me with some evidence and there was an expert, I, you know, when I was a teenager and stuff, in, into my 20s, I was pretty credulous. But, you know, as I've educated myself and grown older and grayer, I realized that what's that old saying? There's no need to attribute to malice, you know, what's actually just ignorance or stupidity or something. There's no need for me to attribute the irrational to something that's just, it's, it's just simply that I don't have all the information and my, right. own foul, and my own fallibility because I have legitimately hallucinated because of um, I was I was drug poisoned once I've had fever and I've also just been uh, hallucinated because of lack of oxygen exhaustion I, I've you know I've had a very colorful life uh, I've been choked out so I understand the different types of hallucinations how they manifest Right. Uh, and my own my own experiences with them. This one's there's a couple, but this one really stands out as absolutely. It, it was probably just some sort of. I mean, I had a blood clot. I mean, we don't know, but it doesn't matter. What I'm, you know, it doesn't have to have some sort of explanation for me to think it was worth, you know, recalling and as an experience. It really it has stuck with me. Maybe maybe I did transcendentally or astrally project into uh, a bad guy's body um, or into his head, or maybe I was just having an incident either way, pretty remarkable. Um, as far as other stuff, I don't really need to get into the other hallucinations just because they're, they're not as interesting or there's pretty banal kind of uh, explanations for them. Like one time I saw a rainbow in a room with no lighting except fluorescent lighting. It was like a basement 
and I had lifted weights by myself and I felt fine. I didn't think I had done much. And all of a sudden right. out of the corner of my eye, I saw a rainbow effect on a wall and there was no way, there's no way that light could reflect. Uh, and I sat there and watched it for about two minutes. This rainbow kept appearing and then it went on another wall. And I was like, what in the hell? My, my other senses were fine. I could tell time. I could, uh, I didn't, my speech wasn't slurred. I wasn't having a stroke. I talked to my instructor who had had this happen to him and other clients where he said, oh, I don't remember what the term was, but there's a term that when you have low blood pressure, there's like an optical illusion that can occur. Yeah. Yet it had no other, you know what I'm saying? You would expect there to be concomitant effects like, or symptoms. There weren't any that I could, I, I tested myself. I was like, all right, I'm fine. I'm, am I seeing this? No, I wasn't. It was a, it was a hallucination. So that's why I don't go into that too much. Uh, as far as inexplicable stuff, I mean, one time my dad was traveling through the, you know, out, we were living out in the woods and he uh, came home and he was white as a ghost and he had his rifle out. He always carried a rifle for the aforementioned moose that we discussed. And because um, he hunted them and also they might kill you. They love to stomp dogs. And um, he, he went down one of those old seismic lines, except there were no hills. It was just this, it was just deep forest. And we're talking out in the middle of nowhere. There's nobody out there. And he was about 20 miles from the house. He turns around in a swamp and the wind was blowing pretty hard in the swamp. So he said, I can't go any further. And as he was coming back, he heard in the swamp and it was daylight. He heard what he thought was a raven. You know, and ravens have this chuckling and cr like crows, they have a chuckle that they do. And ravens can imitate as crows can uh, other noises like, you know, voices and stuff. But it was something odd about it. And the dogs were kind of reacting to it, but not bad. And then for the next, he had to go about eight miles or so through the woods. Uh, he said it began as what sounded like a raven. And it was pacing him. There was more than one. And they were, they were in the woods and they were pacing him. And he said sometimes they, they were like ground level, sometimes higher. But he said um, it started off as sounding like you could pass it off. Oh, it was a bird. He goes, but then it changed. And he said by the end, they were like shrieking laughter and in unintelligible phrases and things at him. And the dogs were just like, like losing their minds the dogs were like looking in all directions and he could barely get them to function and then they finally got scared enough and they just ran like just bolted for the for the river and he dropped down the river and came home so who knows you know there are there are birds up there but we've never i've never heard you know, i've never been chased by them and well, what's uh, the significant uh, significance of the raven showing up the very beginning of the trek Oh, nothing. Just that they're they're around. What I'm getting yeah. at is that there's a, there's a well. He didn't see one. He 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 thought he heard, he thought he heard him. Oh, okay, uh, the call. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What I'm getting at is my dad is um, or was last I talked to him fairly. You know, he had some weird experiences, but he was pretty rational. He was much more of the and then you find out it was the ravens, you know, kind of a thing. And he thought that that the ravens, which we have plenty of around there, were bothering him. But by the time he'd gotten another mile or so he was terrified and my dad you know vietnam veteran you know uh he used to take the team out at night you know he'd go hunting he he uh you know and we're not talking sport hunting my father you know put on the coonskin hat and take a canoe and go up a creek somewhere and you don't see him for two days and he comes back with a bear you know that's that's my dad and so and not superstitious my mother was highly uh she's a fundamentalist christian my father was not quite an atheist but definitely a agnostic he did not believe in god and so he and he didn't believe in ghosts or anything like that we, we do share that similarity he said there are strange things but even you know and his view was pretty similar that even the rational explanation for some things is way beyond our reckoning any other any other yeah sorry i'm trying to process this like a lot, a lot of these things are um uh, the one thing i did want to say when you were talking about your experience on the on the mountaintop um one thing that i read and i don't know where i've i've read this it's probably in some book on um how delta force trains right because i'm writing a i'm writing a book that requires some research on that and one thing, I'm not sure if I read it there, but I may have. One thing that they they teach is like you, a lot of times you have to take out sentries. And I think they found just empirically that if you stare at a sentry long enough, they will look in the direction of where you're hiding. Right. And there's, I don't know why, but if you stare at a sentry long enough, that's, that, that's, that happens. 
Well, so, I'm glad that you brought that up because I, I had meant to bring this up probably 20 minutes ago and it just sort of slipped my mind. So I, I took martial arts, uh, uh, sort of a Krav Maga, World War II, it was World War II combatives um, mm -hmm. for many years. Actually, that's what I did after I, I moved, I got out of dogs and I got out of Alaska. I spent almost seven years training uh, and I was training with mo you know, most of the people. It was a civilian program, but most of the people that were involved in it, I was one of the only real civilians. It was embassy guards and there were three Navy SEALs and there was a, a couple old uh, Vietnam era force recon, you know, Marines mm -hmm. that were there, cops, uh, the, one of the a retired district attorney for King County, which is, that's massive. So uh, I did that for years and it was essentially, it was based on World War II tactics, Fairbairn, Sykes, those guys. And, um, you know, Rex Applegate, like these guys that had, that were training people that because Germans are coming, we, they're going to invade. Uh, so let, let's teach the civilians how to kill people as quickly as possible. Um, and one of the things though, I learned from that course and I went and looked it up. I don't know what, if there's a scientific explanation for it, but yes, the idea that sentries, you cannot stare at a sentry over long be, from, 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 from a hidden position directly behind them even because they will sooner or later uh, get, get edgy. So that's also one of the reasons. And one of the, so that's one of the things that the guy taught. He wasn't interested in the supernatural one little right. freaking bit. He just simply said, if you are ever, because you know, keep in mind that even though he's he was teaching formidable, you know, non-civilians in general, his, his program though was, was designed to teach a little old lady how to do at least something to protect yourself, right? And one of the things that he taught is that avoiding danger is the best martial arts move that there yeah. is. If, if you get a bad feeling as you're walking out to your car, don't go to your car. Go somewhere and observe your car. You know, don't, go, don't put yourself in a situation if your instincts are telling you otherwise. He goes, nine out of 10 times, 9.9 .9 out of 10 times, it's probably just you know, um, your imagination. But that one percentile bit of the time, it's not. And then he cited he cited that um, that study that was done that that did, did officially. <laughs> there was data that was recorded that if you stare at people, especially people who are kind of in a situation where they're on guard, they will eventually or ultimately um, become aware. So whenever I'm in a situation like that, I I certainly. You know, I look back at the, the time when I was with the dogs and all that, I did the right mm -hmm. thing. It doesn't matter whether there was somebody there or not, but it, it does give more credence to the idea that maybe it was a hallucination, but generated by, see, that's the thing is you don't know how your body's going to react to something, right? To stimuli. So you sense something's looking at you and it could be that it's so strong that your brain glitches and you, you know, we imagine things all the time, right? That's how we write science fiction stories. You imagine these incredible events. But what if that happened when you weren't concentrating on it? It's just something that was spawned by the adrenal, you know, adrenaline response. So yeah, I, I think that's really important. Uh, and so what it taught me is just that never ignore your, never ignore that little voice in your back of your head saying, you know, this isn't good. Yeah, sometimes it's not a voice. Like it's just the hair. You just know. Well, I, I did have that happen once that I was I confirmed it. I was sitting in traffic as a passenger in Seattle, and I just got this. It was powerful. And I even said to the lady driving, I said, man. And, and she goes, oh, whatever. And I turned and I looked and nothing. And I turned my head all the way. And there was a guy, at least two lanes over and like four cars back. And he was just staring at me. And with just this, I won't try to imitate it, but he just had his teeth out. And he was just, just like bug-eyed looking at me. And I went, oh. And you know, I didn't, at the time, I don't now attribute any kind of occult or supernatural or uncanny explanation. I just think that we're highly attuned to our surroundings. And I think we just are numb to it. I think we're all, and it goes back to the whole dog thing. When you're with a dog, that wouldn't be a question. That dog would be, but it would have been growling at him. If you're walking down the street and he was looking at you like that, the dog would probably have known. So um, praise dogs. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's certain things that we just <laughs> um, given modern civilization and the accoutrements that are attached to it. There are certain instincts that we've just, don't don't use anymore and the other thing too is i'm going to go and this is kind of more of a, a even wilder theory is that you know we have we have these five senses but there may be you know we're not seeing 
everything that exists in the world. And, and I could be empirical about that. Let's say like you can't see in the infrared spectrum, hmm. right? But if I put on some night vision goggles, I can see uh, infrared chem light. So there, there could be other phenomena that we just don't, we, we just can't detect because we don't have the organs to detect it consciously right and you know to your point infrared there's also black light you know you turn a black light on a room and go oh my god look at all this horrors in my room um right. or this hotel room or whatever that stuff's there and i bet you on some level you do you you are connected to it you do you do you do process it. i mean you know and this goes back to writing this is one of the reasons where i have learned through time and and, and trial and error to just accept you know accept compliments uh, in generally, you know, someone will say, oh, that really reminds me of something. And that must have been your intention. Well, it might not be, you know, I might not have been in intentionally uh, bringing McCarthy's description of the desert into a story, but he's in there. Everything right. that you've ever experienced is in there. And it does come out. Uh, that's why I said about the whole thing about obsession with open or with, 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 um, live burial i didn't wasn't even cognitive you know conscious of it it was something that but it was there and i think that applies to writing and i th i think that you know, our patterns of behavior and i think it does apply to you know our senses and, that, and that's why i don't get all worked up about whether there are ghosts and goblins they don't have to be there are right. the inexplicable contaminates the rational That was very deep thought right there. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, it's just there's and, and there's things out there that we just, you know, you know, thousands of years ago, we might have called again, this is the author Clark, you know, any sufficiently advanced technology would appear like magic to somebody who's not, you know, initiated or there could, you know, even just physical effects. So as an example, um, out here in Big Sur, have you ever heard of the Dark Watchers? Yep, I actually almost put them in my crime novel, but I, I couldn't. So yes, I've heard of them. And didn't didn't Steinbeck? Uh, it was Steinbeck mm -hmm. mentioned, but I don't remember. It was either it was Red Pony kid. or it was his kid. Uh, I, I didn't remember if it was Steinbeck, but a famous author's kid actually wrote about them. Well, so did so did Steinbeck. It's in one of his short stories. It might be the Red Pony or or that. Or Wait, that. I haven't read that, so I don't know. But it's not um, a secret. A lot of people, you're talking about, yeah, you're talking about California. That's they've also discovered that there's an infrasound. Exactly. Some of the rocks. Well, okay, right. So for people who don't know what we're talking about, there are like rock gardens along there, and that they have discovered that there's. And this was brought up, I think, even during the Havana alleged Havana, you know, mm -hmm. uh, acoustic frequency, you know, frequencies uh, causing people to have brain hemorrhages or whatever. Maybe that's, you know, maybe that's foreign, uh, foreign uh, military activity, or, or, or agencies or whatever. Which I do, I do actually touch on that in my books a little bit, and I find that to be pr pretty. You know, super science is, is a lot of fun, but um, yeah, the, they found that the wind going through the rocks in some of those places creates infrasound, which can mess with your uh i don't know if it messes with your electromagnetic field but i imagine it does but it can actually cause you to have uh you know a visual and and like uh your know, oral uh, uh, hallucinations yeah and, and they're and also paranoia right so like, well, that's right it, it messes with your it, in other words it can mess with you almost on a chemical or a biochemical level which i thought i found to be, so in words, you're not just hearing stuff and going i think i hear my name it's actually messing with your, either your elect electromagnetic field and or your brain chemistry, which I found to be very, that's very compelling. Yeah. And you don't even hear it. So it, it, right. it the infra, infrasound comes from the, so just for po folks who don't know what, what, what the dark watchers are. So in, in kind of the big Sur area um, near Monterey, where there's, there's a lot of cliffs, facing the ocean, crash of waves, et cetera. On the, hill, on the hilltops, people have reported for hundreds of years, like this is not, oh, this is not it, some- Conquistadors were talking about it, yeah. They would see these, uh, these dark figures that were, you know, 10 feet tall, like very, very, very tall, some with a hat, but these shadows on the, on the hilltops that would just kind of gaze into the ocean around a certain time of day and 
uh, you know, it's mentioned in one of Steinbeck's works, as I mentioned, it might be the red pony, something like that. Or, or it was one of his short stories. Cause as you know, um, Steinbeck worked in the big Sur area for a period of you know, a certain period of his life. Um, but, you know, around the same parts, there's this, you know, the waves create this infrasound, uh, infrasound and infrasound has those effects on people. Now, whether or not the dark watchers are infrasound or there's some other phenomenon, who knows, but that, that has been one of the frequent explanations for what's causing it. You bet. And, and so I got one last thing, I imagine we should probably wrap this section up, but I, yeah, the inexplicable, uh, that doesn't have an uncanny component, but it's strange nonetheless. And the explanation for it's really strange. So in 89, I worked on the Valdi or the Exxon oil spill. I was out Valdez and all, you know, all oh, the places. Wow. Right. And so I was just a kid. I was 19. And what happened is that thousands of you know, civilians, there were some contractors too, but there were, you know, professionals, but lots of just non-professionals like myself were instead of fishing, the fishing boat captains and crews were commissioned to basically house all the workers. So we lived on fishing boats that year instead of, so instead of fishing, we were just going around and I'd never been in that part of the, the country, but long story short, it doesn't really matter. The point, the point is I worked with this one guy and we'll just call him Bill. So I'm 19, Bill's probably 32, 33, about my height. Uh, he weighed probably, I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna say about 160 pounds. So he's like average height, weighed about 160 pounds, skinny, pot belly, like he's, you know, he, he was definitely not a specimen and we would be working out on the beaches and we would be uh, carrying bags of, um, you know, contaminated seaweed and rocks and whatnot. And the bags were up to 80 pounds and he would have to put, like dump out some of the bag. He, he would never carry more than about 40 pounds. Sweat be pouring down. He works really slowly, chain smoking. He's always smoking. Whenever we'd have time off, he'd drink like the weekend away, that kind of thing. So this guy is, you know, I could carry, I mean, I literally had had to carry him a couple of times because he got so tired, but there was this really interesting thing that happened. We had a little bit of downtime and this kid that worked for the boat crew, probably in his early twenties, about six foot two, six foot three, 240. And he looked like a, a movie star. He was just, he, he liked to, you know, work with no shirt on, not an ounce of fat on him and big arms, big chest, big back. And he would, would, he would do these contests where he would skin like these 300 pound halibut in like 20 seconds. He'd go, all right, ready? And they would time him and he would, ju 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 ju. so he, this guy was badass. He's taking, you know, oil drums and he couldn't carry one around. They weighed 600 pounds, but he could flip one up without a lot of effort. I mean, this guy was a, boot, a beast. And what happened is, you know, as with a bunch of young guys, the arm wrestling tournament began. But because there were older guys mixed in, the arm wrestling tournament for money began. And so I remember this kid, Jim, he took the biggest, strongest, best arm wrestler, and no, nobody's a professional, and they're locked up. It's just like a Hollywood movie. They start going, and the kid looks at him and goes, are you going to start? And then he just slam him, and the guy would be like crying, with holding, you know, holding his arm. That's how hard he slam him. Finally, my buddy Bill... He's just sitting there smoking. And like the second, like this had kind of died down. They did it for a day. And then they, the next day, he, the kid had beaten one or two guys and nobody wanted to arm wrestle him. And it was like 50 bucks to arm wrestle him, whatever it was. And he takes his cigarette. I'll never forget this. He goes, ah, I'm gonna go take his money. And he just threw his, his cigarette down and he walks over and says, let's go. And the guy laughed at him and they put the money down. They lock up and this kid towers over him. And they go in like this and Bill just looks him in the eye and he goes, are you going to start? He slammed him as harder, harder than that kid had been slamming everybody. The kid wasn't able to even use his, his knife hand the rest of the day. He was walking around holding his arm. So Bill comes back with his wad of money. And he goes back to smoking and being lazy and like a little sloth, like a little panda bear. And I said, are you a, a pro arm wrestler? He goes, no. He goes, I've arm wrestled like 50 times in my life. I've never lost. And I said, are you sandbagging? Like when you're carrying stuff, are you just, I said, I've known people that are a lot stronger than they look. He goes, no, no. He goes, those bags are heavy. I said, what's your secret? And he said, I learned when I was really young, I was talking to this old guy who was sort of into mysticism. And he said to me, just imagine if you don't want to be moved, imagine that there is a, a, a like a, like a bar, like an a bar of energy going like stronger than steel going through the earth. He goes, imagine the earth is transfixed by this, you know, Archimedean bar. He goes, and it goes through whatever part of your body you don't want moved. 
He goes, so I imagine I don't want my arm moved. He goes, no one can move my arm. He goes, you, he goes, I don't, he goes, I don't think you could like push it over with a car. He goes, I, I literally, I think my arm might break. He goes, I've never lost. He goes, it doesn't work for anything else. He goes, but I cannot be picked up and I cannot have my arm bent if I don't want it to be. And after watching that, I believe him. So I'll, I'll leave, I'll leave this segment with that little story. Yeah. On that note, thank you very much, Laird. And uh, we'll <laughs> see you in the next one pretty shortly. Thank you.